we have in this week's parsha talks about there's a, a pasuk that says hey lachem zera take for yourselves grain now so in the Haggadah, we say at the beginning, Hey Lach Ma'anya, or some Haggadah say, Halach Ma'anya, this is the bread of affliction. We say, Hey Lach Ma'anya, the bread of poverty, the bread of affliction. The Arizal says that when we say, Hey Lach Ma'anya, in the Haggadah, that is a tikkun that repairs the damage that Yosef did when he said, Hey Lachem Zerah, take grain for yourselves. Now, just to zoom out a little and talk about the context of what is this, take grain, what's he saying, what's going on. So, the, the situation that was going on, you know, in this time, behind this whole story, right, the reason that Yosef's brothers came down to Mitzrayim was to get grain. Um, because there was a famine, Yosef rose to power when he interpreted Pari's dreams. Pari had the dreams about the the grain and the cows, which were the dreams, the message of the dreams were that there are going to be seven years of abundance followed by seven years of famine. And then Yosef made the suggestion during the seven years of abundance, store, accumulate grain so that you'll have when the seven years of famine come. Then when the famine hit, everyone was coming to me trying to buy grain. And the grain that was, was stored was stored on behalf of, um, belonged to Paro not to the people. And over time, when people would come to Yosef to get grain, both foreigners as well as locals who lived in Egypt, as well as Egyptians, they would have to buy grain. So when the family hit, they would come to Yosef. Yosef was the only source of food available in the region. People would come to him to buy food. And he had various things that he would have them do. Number one, they had to pay. Eventually, people, even the Egyptians, ran out of money. The price, you know, of goods goes up when there's scarcity. Yosef was the only source. There was no competition. He had a monopoly on food. Having a monopoly on food is very good for the vendor, very bad for everyone else. The prices went up. People ran out of money. The Egyptians had no money left to buy food. So they come to Yosef and they say, feed us. And he says, pay up. And they say, we've got no money left. You took all the money. So then what Yosef did was he took away their property. He made them sell their property to the state or to trade ownership of their property for the food. So eventually all the land in Egypt, aside from the from the leaders, from the priests, all everyone else's land now became the property of Pare, and he exchanged that for food. Now what happened when Yosef did that, he had a, a specific intent in mind, and that was once he takes away their property, there's no more property ownership, he can now t- tell people where they do and don't have the right to live. He mixed people up, moved people around, which now meant that his family, his brothers and their families, were no longer strangers, right? When we talked a little bit about the, the mindset of being a stranger several weeks ago. You know, there's challenges. Let's say a, a, a child moves to a new school, right? It's something that can come with a lot of challenges, being in a new environment. Why is coming to a new school difficult? The reason that coming to a new school is, a new school is difficult is because... Right? It's a new environment, you're a stranger, but it's not just that you're a stranger, it's that you're an outsider. The first day of pre-1A or the first day of high school, let's say, if, I mean, assuming that it's, a, let's say there's a school district where high schools have no continuity from elementary schools. You come to high school, brand new group of friends, brand new people, everyone starting out fresh. That's much less intimidating than in the middle of 11th grade, in the middle of the year, coming to a new school. Why is that less intimidating? Because when you come to a new school at the beginning of high school and everyone's new, everyone's in the same boat. Yeah, it, it, it might be, you know, some people, it might be more difficult than others, but it's not that intimidating. You're coming to a new environment, everyone's in a new environment. Everyone's more or less in the same situation. If you come into a new school in the middle of 11th grade and everyone's been together for two and a half years and now you're a new person coming into an environment, it's very, very different. There's a stable environment with groups and people have developed, you know, the social arrangements already over two and a half years. And now you're coming into that as an outsider. There's a very strong contrast between an outsider and all the in people. So Yosef said, excellent idea. My brothers, their families, they came from outside. They are strangers. They are outsiders. I can't change the fact that they came from the outside. But what I can do is equalize things and make everybody 
a brand new start, mix people around, everybody gets a fresh start. And what he did by doing that was equalize things for his brothers and their families, so they were in the same boat as everybody else. So his intent there was very positive, at least in the context of his own family, first of all. Another one of the things that Yosef did with the leverage that he had by being the only source of food in, during a famine and a time of scarcity of food was he had everybody get circumcised. Everybody had to have a, all men, had to have a bris miller, had to be circumcised, which again, why did Yosef do that? Why, what was his motivation? Very simple. Hashem told his great-grandfather Avram that him and his offspring and all his household should be circumcised. It's a good thing. It's a way of connecting to Hashem and revealing godliness. It's like, if I've got le leverage, let me use that to get everybody to do that. More good is, is better. So that's another thing that he did. So Yosef used his leverage to do all these things, which seem like good things. The intent was certainly positive. They seem like they actually were positive. So what exactly is the Arizal? Why is the Arizal telling us? What does it mean when the Arizal says that when we say, hey, Lachmani in the Haggadah, the Pesach said, that's a tickle that repairs the damage that Yosef did when he said, hey, Lachem Zara, take the grain. He was doing a whole, he was using that leverage to achieve a whole bunch of really positive things. How did that cause damage? What was the damage? What's, right, a tikkun, the word tikkun means repair. You know, the expression goes, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. If we need to be masakin, we need to repair what Yosef did by using his leverage with the grain to make all these things happen. Apparently, he did something wrong and he broke something that we need to repair. So, how could this possibly have been bad? What's going on here? So, what it all boils down to, basically, is that, well, first of all, what actually happened, let's talk about the mechanics before we get to the how and why, when Yosef did these things, he used his leverage as a result of having access to food to make all of these things happen. What he did was, the terminology, the Kabbalistic terminology is he added klipos into Mitzrayim. Or he added chayos, he added life force and energy to the klipos, to the negativity, to the forces of negativity in Mitzrayim. So he actually made the Golos stronger. He made the exile stronger and deeper. He strengthened everything that was negative about Egypt, which made the exile worse. What did he do then? Sorry? How did, could he add to the Klippos by doing those things? By doing the things that he did? Yeah. What's, do you yeah. want to elaborate on the question? Why not? Like, for example, why, why would the Brismila add Klippos? That's exactly the question. That's exactly the question that's asked, and that's exactly what we're here to address, right? Because how does it make sense? We always know, we all know that it's possible to add energy to negativity, generally by doing bad things. When we do wrong things, we add energy to negativity, because we have energy and we channel energy. When we're involved in negative things, we're challenging, channeling that energy into negative things. When we do good things, we're channeling that energy and adding energy into good things. So how does it make sense that by doing good things, he was adding energy into negativity, right? That's exactly the question. Now, exactly how we will get to... You know what? We can, let, let, let's get to it now. Oh, well, this really comes up in the text that's much later on, but we can bring it in now. So, there was a gathering of... A Sifa a gathering of rabbis at one point. It was during the time of the Friedrich Grave, I believe. And they were talking about the approach to, you know, there's so many forces that are driving assimilation and pulling people away from turn mitzvahs, pulling people away from their tradition and their roots, and what can we do to bring them closer? And they were talking about different ways of going about it. And without getting into the details too much yet, because we're going to develop that through the conversation, there was a difference of opinion about something, and the Friedrich Graeber insisted and said, no, like, that's not the way to do it, that's wrong. And the person who was suggesting doing it used the metaphor and said, listen, I agree with you that this is not ideal. Let's say that you are taking a cup of water to drink. You want that water to be clean. You don't want to drink dirty water. That being said, if there is a house on fire and you need to put the fire out, 
You don't, and someone gives you a hose or a bucket of water, not a house on fire, you couldn't, a bucket of water would be useless. Let's say there's something in a house that just caught on fire. And someone says, here's a bucket of water, pour it over, you don't stop and say, well, hang on, is this water clean? I don't know, like, yeah, this water doesn't look so good. It's like, what are you saying? You're putting out a fire, just pour the water on it. <coughs> and so the free group says, that's true, if it's water. But what happens if there's a glass pitcher on the counter and there's a fire and someone says, here's a pitcher of water, pour it on, and you stop and you sniff the picture, and they say, what do you care how clean it is? It's a fire, just pour it on the what fire. And you say, hang on a second. This does smell like fire. Water, this is kerosene. Do you still want me to pour it on the fire? Right? Now, the, the beauty of this metaphor is, if you walk into someone's kitchen, right, and, I don't know, a, a paper towel was too close to the stove and it caught on fire, and there's a glass pitcher on the countertop in the kitchen filled with a transparent liquid. It would be reasonable to expect that it's water and to just take it and pour it on the paper towel. Right? <coughs> Makes sense. Why? Because it's a pitcher filled with a transparent liquid in a kitchen is probably water. Now, let's say that you are in a laboratory. A laboratory. I don't know which pronunci pronunciations from where anymore. I can't keep track. You're in a lab. There we go. That's <laughs> pressure for everyone. You're in a lab and a fire breaks out. God forbid, and there's a, you know, a, a, a beaker with a transparent liquid in it, you're in a lab, you might not just assume that it's necessarily water. Now, in this environment where you know there's all kinds of creative and different things going on, who knows what's inside of there? So it makes a lot of sense to say, hang on a second, let's just smell this first and check whether it's water before we go pour it on the fire, because who knows what that is? Could be all kinds, could be ethanol, could be kerosene, could be who knows what. So... The how Yosef added energy to Klippos is because he confused water and kerosene. Right? And the reason that happened, right, let's say that you're in a lab, it could be that the beaker does have water in it and it would be a good idea to pour it on the fire. So what do you do? If you walk into a lab, right, you walk in and there are people working and if you see a fire and the fire breaks out and people are like, oh my goodness, fire, fire, and you see a big beaker full of water sitting on the counter top, what, what would be reasonable to do? You ask one of the people, what's in here? Is it water? Is it water? If they say yes, you pour it on the fire. If they say it's kerosene, you don't pour it on the fire. Very simple. Mm -hmm. If you just walk in and you're like, oh, transparent liquid, awesome, pour it on the fire. If that's kerosene, you just make things a whole lot worse and people are going to be like, oh, what are you doing? No one asked you to pour kerosene on the fire. Right, so what Yosef did was, he decided of his own initiative, ooh, this would be a good thing to do, this would be a good idea. And because he decided of his own initiative, he mistook the kerosene for water and made things a whole lot worse. Now let's say, let's pull up, dial it back a little and say, maybe it's not talking about a fire. Maybe we're talking about giving someone to drink, water to drink, right? And... You know, this can happen in some places in Brooklyn, people who live at the bottom of hills, I know it's an issue for, for, for me sometimes. Sometimes you turn on the tap and the water is clearly not that clean, right? The sediment builds up and there's blood and all that stuff. It happens. Now, if I have bottled water in the fridge and the water coming out of the tap doesn't look that good, I'm going to leave the tap running to let the water clear out a little and take a, a cup of bottled water from the fridge. Let's say that someone comes into my house and someone stumbles in and they're, they're, or I'm walking into the building and there's someone out the front of the house and they're on the brink of dying of dehydration, God forbid. They haven't had anything to drink in days and they're like, you know, and I bring them into the house and I turn on the tap to take some water and I don't have any bottled water and the water doesn't look amazing and I say, oh, the water doesn't look that good. It's like, what are you insane? You think this person cares? Like, you know, right now it's not a matter of of 100% of 100% hydration versus 102%, so better wait a few minutes for the water to clear out. It's like this person's going to die. They're not going to die because the water's like got a little bit of a tint to it. Is it not ideal? It's not ideal. But you know what's more not ideal? Dying of dehydration. So just give them the water, even if it's not quite the best. That's true. But if someone's dying of dehydration, that doesn't mean you should give them kerosene to drink. Right? So yes, it's and, and this is where things can get, the line can become somewhat fine. It's not a fine line, there's a very clear line and we'll get to it. But when we're talking about a situation in which, yes, it would be a good idea, 
maybe to give this person water to drink that ideally I wouldn't drink. Not because I care any less about them, but because right now if we do a cost-benefit analysis, the cost of not having water is greater than the cost of drinking water that's not exactly ideal. And if it was me in the same situation, God forbid, I'd do the same thing for myself. It's a question of, of circumstances. Mm -hmm. So there are circumstances where it makes sense to drink water that it might not make sense to drink in other circumstances. But it, there are no circumstances in which it makes sense to drink kerosene, ever. Right? So, and where Yosef went wrong was he took the liberty to look at things and say, oh, this is a good idea. I'm going to do this. And because he did things of his own initiative without Hashem telling him to and without consulting, he just took his own initiative. He was that guy who walked in the lab, picked up the beaker and poured it on the fire and it just ended up being kerosene. It could have been water. It's not always bad, but it might be. And that's why he went wrong. So, and we have a similar thing with Moshe Rabbeinu, right? When Hashem was telling Moshe Rabbeinu when he was on Har Sinai, getting the Torah and Hashem tells him uh, you better go down because you... so the words Hashem uses it the people you brought out of Mitzrayim just messed up big time right the golden calf so Hashem says this is all nice and fine up here but you've got some damage control to do you better go back down why did Hashem say the nation you brought out of, of Egypt it's like Hashem sent him to bring him out of Egypt right it's like I ask you to do something for me, and then the thing I asked you to do ends up going wrong. I'm like, well, what did you do that for? It's like, excuse me, you, you told me to. But Hashem asked Moshe Rabbeinu to take the Jews out of Egypt and bring them out. Now, there was a specific group of people who were consistently the troublemakers, and yes, lots of people were involved in the Golden Calf, but the people who drove it were the Erev Rav. Mm -hmm. The Erev Rav were a group of people who were Egyptian, they weren't originally Jewish, uh, they also like weren't blind, and when they saw what was going on, they saw the ten plagues. They saw what was going on. They said, "Whoa, whoa, whoa, whoa! whoa like, we'll just we're with you. Whatever you say, we're, we're going to join you guys because you're clearly on the winning team." So they wanted to become Jewish and and, and leave. And Moshe Rabbeinu said, "Okay, sure." Now, because Moshe Rabbeinu did that of his own initiative, it's not necessarily a bad thing. It wasn't an unreasonable proposition. But not everything that's reasonable, right? Sometimes you look at something someone did and you'll say, well, what were you thinking, seriously? Right, but sometimes you look at something someone did and it ends up having been a really, really big mistake. But you can also understand that considering the circumstances, it wasn't a reasonable decision. It was a reasonable calculation that they made and what they did make sense and was reasonable it just happened to turn out badly. And your response is going to be very different. Right, but the fact that something's reasonable doesn't mean it's right. Sometimes something's reasonable, but it can be really, really bad. And this was another one of those examples. Moshe Rabbeinu wasn't unreasonable, but he decided himself to say, yeah, sure, join, come join, come along with us, all good. He didn't ask Hashem. He just did it himself. And because he did it himself, not because he did it himself, but because it turns out that it was the wrong thing to do, and Andy asked Hashem, Hashem might have said no. And because he did it himself, despite the fact that it was reasonable, it was wrong, and these people turned out to be huge troublemakers who caused no end of grief for Moshe Rabbeinu and all the Jewish people. If not for them, the golden calf would have never happened. Right? And because of them, the golden calf did happen, and we're in Golos today because of what they did. Because Moshe Rabbeinu decided, now obviously I'm, you know, getting a little bit hyperbolic here, you know, all respect to Moshe Rabbeinu, but the bottom line is Hashem said that to him. This is from Hashem's mouth, not from mine. Hashem was criticizing him and attributing the responsibility and the blame to Moshe Rabbeinu because you didn't ask me. You decided to take these people out and look at all the trouble they're making. So he said, go back. Trump, you've got damage control to do because the people you brought out of Egypt just made a whole lot of trouble. Go fix it. The same thing here. All the things Joseph did were reasonable. But when we do things that are reasonable without consulting those who are better informed, sometimes things that are reasonable are still wrong. Same thing happened here. Yosef Hatzadik did things that were reasonable, right? And none of us, I don't think any of us sitting here can come up with reasons why they were at face value bad decisions. The thing that was a bad decision was to go ahead with it without consulting or getting any directive from Hashem. Now, 
to be fair, right, let's, you know, make sure that we're not oversimplifying things and leaving room for, you know, reasonable responses and challenges to this because there are some. <coughs> it's true that, you know, it's not like Yosef was at liberty to just send Hashem a DM and say, hey, I had this idea, like, should I do it? Right? So, to what, do, and, you know, sometimes you have a good idea and, and there's no one to ask and you've got to make a decision. It's not necessarily the wrong thing to make, it's always the right thing to make the best decision we can. Sometimes the best decision is to ask someone better informed. Sometimes we don't have that option and we have to just go with what we have. That's true. You know what's also true? Sometimes when we go with what we have, we might do something that ends up being really bad, which is what happened here. So I guess we could say there are two parts of the lesson here. Number one is, if there's someone available who's better informed or has better access, if you can ask Hashem, you can ask someone who has more Torah knowledge, someone who's better plugged in, a, a tzaddik, a rebbe, something like that. If you have access to ask, go ask before you make a big decision like that on your own. And if not, do, you know, be aware that, you know, sometimes reasonable decisions might still be bad. And so the, the thing that the Rebbe is really bringing it back to here is helping people, bringing people closer to Hashem. Because that's what Yosef was doing, right? Yosef wanted to circumcise, had all the Egyptians circumcised to close the gap between them and David, to connect them to Hashem, to bring Hashem and integrate Hashem into Egypt and the people and the culture and the society more to a greater degree that's what he was aiming to do his intentions were positive no one's criticizing that and perhaps even the calculation that he made was reasonable but any calculation we make on our own carries some risk reasonable isn't always right and that's what happened here and this was the topic of conversation at that convention when they were talking about what to do what not to do you know, do, do, we, do we bend the rules here? Do we lower the standards there to help connect people to their heritage and to their culture, to bring people closer to Torah and Mitzvahs, to connect people, to get people on board with the, the life that, that they should ideally be living for their own sake, for our sake, and for the sake of Hashem and the purpose of existence? Sometimes the answer is yes, in some things. Not to bend the rules, but to lower standards. Okay, so here's the... Ultimately, it's never a good idea to bend the rules. But the rules of Torah and the rules of Halacha, by definition, respect reality and have leeway and flexibility within them. Very simple, you know, classic, stereotypical example. I have a story of someone who told me once, well, told me, she's told me multiple times, that it was Rabbi Malo. Olashon, was one of the Rabbonim on the basement of Crown Heights a while back. And she said she remembers once calling him and she had a question about something that happened in the kitchen and something got missed, something, the pot I don't remember exactly. And he was asking her, and she's describing the situation, what happened, and she wants to know, could she use the food? She did not use the food, and he's asking her, he kept on asking her, you really need it? Like, do you really need this for Shabbos for your meal? Like, you really need it? You really need it? And she didn't get what was going on. And now she looks back and laughs and realizes he was basically asking her to say, yeah, I really need it. It's going to ruin my whole Shabbos. It's going to ruin my whole meal. Why? What does he care? He cares because the, the, a Rav doesn't get to decide. A Rav's job is to represent Torah and to let us know what Torah says, what Halacha says. Now, in Halacha, there's something called L'Chatechila B'Diyavid. L'Chatechila means the way you have to do it. B'Diyavid means, what about if it already happened? You are never allowed to mix milk and meat, ever, period. If some drop of milk fell into your pot of chicken soup and got mixed in while it was cooking, the question is, what do you do now? So it depends on how much and all the other things. So you're never allowed to pour milk into chicken soup, ever, dairy milk. Sometimes if it happened, it's okay, you're allowed to use it. Now sometimes if it happened, you're still not allowed to use it, but if it's a situation in which the cost is going to be very high, you would be allowed to use it. Now, that cost may come in different ways. What if 
this particular dish and I just picked chicken soup out of a hat, but what if it fell into, you know, a big pot of beef stew that you made and you were going to freeze it and use it over the course of six months to defrost and this is like a $500 pot of food and you have to throw it out now, that's like a very big expense. That would be one example. So sometimes Allah says, look, if this happened, you're not allowed to use it. If it's a case in which the cost is very high, then you are allowed to use it. Or it may be, maybe the dish isn't particularly expensive, but you have a Shabbos meal tonight and a hundred guests are coming, or a Sheva Brochus, or a party, or something, and the financial cost not so high, but the impact on your experience is going to be massive. You have all these people coming in and be like, sorry, I've got no food, like a drop of milk fell into everything, and we've got nothing to eat. That's also an extremely high cost. So in these different cases, there are times when the halakha will say, you're not allowed to use it, if the circumstances warrant it, sometimes you can. Now, are you allowed to serve pork steak because that's what's available and you have a bunch of guests coming? No. But there are some circumstances where something happened that you generally wouldn't be allowed to use, but because of the circumstances, you're allowed to. Now, another kind of circumstance that will justify different things, right? So, just before we go there, actually, just to clarify. So, what we see here is the halacha is the halacha. When the rabbi was, the rav was asking her, do you really, really need it? Because he was prompting her, because sometimes, right, and this is just a, a, just some general, you know, advice. If you're ever calling a rav at any point with a question about something, you want to know, like, can I, can't I, whatever it is. Number one, before you ask a question, articulate what you're asking. Give any piece of information that might possibly be able to be relevant, lay out all the information. A lot of times, something that you assume is not going to be relevant and is not going to make any difference to the Rav who really understands the intricacies of the Halacha, that thing might make a difference, right? Sometimes someone goes to the doctor and they say, you know, I'm feeling this or that or whatever, and then the doctor starts asking a bunch of questions. It's like, well, what does that have to do with anything? Like, who cares? Right, well, as someone who may not be that well informed, it seems like that. But the reason the doctor's asking those questions is because it does matter, right? Because a person shows up with a symptom or with two or three symptoms, there might be a hundred different conditions that could all have someone show up with this symptom or these two or three symptoms that the person reported. Now, how do you differentiate between them? You've got to start asking because each one of those conditions is going to have a different combination of other symptoms or lack thereof. Now, the person who shows up at the doctor's office doesn't know that and doesn't know that, yes, they have a fever and they're throwing up, but like, you know, whether or not they're sleeping well, or whether or not they have an appetite, or what happened last week and how they're feeling two weeks ago might be relevant. So they don't say it. And so then, you know, what happens usually when a person goes to the doctor and reports symptoms, it's very common that the doctor then asks a whole series of questions. Because they're asking for the information that they know is relevant, that you might not have realized was relevant. And it's the same thing here. The Rav she didn't assume that it makes a difference how many people she's cooking for or what it's for. It's like, is it kosher? Is it not kosher? But he knew that it was relevant. He was asking. He was trying to help her out and say, like, do you really, really need this? Is it going to be a really big deal if you have to throw it out? Because if the answer is yes, then she'd be allowed to use it. If the answer is no, then not really. So, whenever, anytime you're asking a rubber question, just anything that might possibly be able to be relevant on an off chance, the more information the better. Just give all the information then ask the question and because something you said that you think doesn't really make a difference might make all the difference at the end of the day. So two things are true here at the same time. Number one is the halacha is the halacha. You don't get to serve something you're not allowed to serve regardless. That being said, the halacha in the conclusion about whether or not you're allowed to eat the food, the circumstances are some of the factors that are considered when that halachic decision is made. So we don't get to bend the rules, but the rules do apply different standards and different decisions in different circumstances. And that's really the, the, the distinction that's important. Right, so sometimes, let's say that You know, I'll, I'll give you a tangible example. It's a little bit random, but I think it's going to illustrate clearly. I went to, when I, I was a bacher and I would, before I got married, I would go and so, so for Purim, I went to my Mitzvah and I brought someone to read Megillah, and I figured we're reading Megillah, everyone does Megillah. There are like three other Mitzvahs on Purim. It's not just Megillah. If I'm already getting people together at a Purim party to read Megillah, why shouldn't I try to get them to do as many Mitzvahs as possible? So I brought a Pushka Sleikud Gift Tzedakah, they could give them a ton of Sleikud. 
and we brought Mishlach Manas packages that they could exchange and pass around. That's three out of four mitzvahs. And then there's a Purim Surah. Now, at the Surah, you're supposed to wash and eat bread and meat. And I figured, you know what, you're supposed to wash and eat bread and meat. But if you eat bread, you have a, an obligation mid Isa to bench afterwards. Now, I know that most of these people are not going to bench after they eat bread. So I'm getting them to do the mitzvah of eating the Purim soda at the cost of them eating bread without benching, which is a, a, a obligation, a doirais, a scriptural obligation. After you will eat, you will be satisfied and you will bless. Generally, all brachas are rabbinic, with the one and only exception to that is birchas amazin, grace after meals for bread. So I went to Rav and I asked him, like, What's the cost benefit analysis here? Do I get them to do the mitzvah when it's at the expense of them, them eating bread without benching, or am I better off just not doing it and they don't do the mitzvah, but they also don't eat without benching? And so he said to me that, and it's something I wasn't aware of at the time, but I've since you know seen it in multiple places and become more aware of it, that the most important part of the the, the mitzvah of Suda on Purim is meat and wine. Now, generally speaking, bread is an important part of a Suda, and it, we should. So what he said to me was, they can fulfill the mitzvah of the Purim Suda with meat and wine. So take some light wine, bottle of light wine, anyone who wants can have. Take some, you know, crackers and cold cuts or some sort of meat. They can eat the meat, drink the wine, they fulfill the mitzvah 100%. Is it the ideal? Execution of the mitzvah? No. And so he said to me, when you have your Purim soda, you have to wash and eat bread. I'm not telling you you don't. But if you want them to do the mitzvah without the aver, you can give them the meat and the wine. They're doing the mitzvah, the, the, the actual mitzvah itself they're fulfilling, not in the ideal sense, but now what you've solved is you're also not making them eat bread without benching. Right? So he said to me, you still have to wash when you have your Purim soda. I'm not saying you don't have to wash. That is part of it. That's part of doing it in the ideal execution of the mitzvah. That being said, if there are people who are going to not bench as a result, or let's say someone comes to me and says, I want to do the Purim Surah, but I, I, I'm celiac, I can't eat bread. You're not going to say, well, eat bread anyways to a celiac, obviously. You also don't have to say, now let's say the, the Purim Surah, the Mitzvah, is bread. If that's what it was, you could say, okay, look, you're, you're exempt from this Mitzvah. No one wants someone to eat, eat a Purim Surah and die as a result, or you know, be hospitalized, God forbid, so don't do it. Yes, true. Or if someone says, like, I'm, I'm, I'm just not going to eat bread. It's not my thing. I don't eat bread. Okay, what am I going to do? That, but, so if a person in that situation can do the mitzvah without the bread, let them do the mitzvah without the bread. If letting them off the bread part is going to get them to do the mitzvah, then do it. I still have to eat the bread. That being said, if... I, you know, just if, if I, so the halacha for me is that I, I do need to eat the bread and for them it's that they don't need to eat the bread. So we both have to observe the halacha, but the halacha takes circumstances into account. And that's the fine line. The fine line, and it's not so, it's a fine line, but it is a distinct black and white line. And that is, there are expectations or levels of idealness in observance that don't need to be demanded of everyone, and if doing things in a less demanding way will increase someone's likelihood of fulfilling the mitzvah, will increase their likelihood of connecting to Torah, to mitzvahs, to the Creator, etc. A lot of times that is the right thing to do. Right, if someone comes and they're really interested and they want to get involved and they want to learn and you say, well, you've got to do this like up to you know, level 11 out of 10 on everything, it's like that's usually not the way to go. That being said, you also don't tell them, oh, you should have a Shabbos meal, but like if you want to serve pork, like it's fine, whatever, just have it. No, it's not fine. Do you need to scream at them for doing it? Also not. But you can't tell someone, it's fine, you can have a Shabbos meal with pork. Better just don't, don't have a Shabbos meal. I'm not telling someone that to start, but don't do a Shabbos meal if it's going to be a Shabbos meal that's bringing up errors into the, the equation. Can, if someone says, look, I want to celebrate Shabbos and have a Shabbos meal, and there's not going to be anything negative about it, but they're not going to do everything exactly right, go ahead, make the Shabbos meal. It's a beautiful thing. It's something that impacts people, and it, it wakes people up. It's an emotional experience. It's an experience of connection. Go ahead and do it. 
There's a big difference between doing something at a non-ideal level of observance versus doing something wrong. Right, and that's the that that's why the Friedrich Weber used that metaphor of the clean water versus the dirty dirty water. Dirty water is not ideal, hundred percent. It's not ideal. It's not ideal to drink. Putting it out on a fire probably doesn't make any difference at all, effectively. But let's say for when it comes to drinking, right? If someone's about to die of dehydration and the water is not the best water, but there's nothing in it that's going to kill them, give them the water because not giving them the water is going to kill them. Does that mean if they're about to die of dehydration and you've got a cup of kerosene, pour it down their throat? No, because that's going to kill them faster. Right? So doing things at a non-ideal level is the equivalent of, metaphorically, the non-ideal water. It's the water. It's water. It's not the best water. So if someone has access to the best water and someone wants to have, you know, optimal state of health and well-being, etc., and it's very important for them, they've got the basics covered, they've got when many layers above the basics covered, and to them it's important to only drink really, really, really clean, healthy, good water, it makes sense, it's not an unreasonable thing. But to let someone die of dehydration because that's water's not available is extremely unreasonable. It's as unreasonable as giving them kerosene to drink, right? So the question is, and that's the guiding principle here. The guiding principle here is, does Torah say to do this or does Torah say not to do this? And this is why we have to have people to ask. You know, and, and another example, just, you know, a, a similar sort of thing. If, let, let's say, I don't know, I'm going to make up an example. It's a bit extreme and random, but just to illustrate, if someone you know, grew up in the jungle and they don't know anything about pills and, and pharmaceutical medications, etc. And then, you know, you meet them and you bring them to your house and they have a headache and you give them a couple of Tylenols and you just tell them, to just take it, it'll help. And then like 45 minutes later, they feel better and they're like, oh my goodness, this is amazing, wow. And then they come back to your house the next day and maybe the Tylenols were generics so they didn't say Tylenol and they were just white pills. And then the next day, there's a different white pill on the counter that looks very similar, and they have a headache, and they say, oh, let me take that pill, when that pill happens to be something completely different. It's like, whoa, 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 slow down. It's like, yesterday I took something that looked like this, and it made me feel better. It's like, yeah, this looks the same, but it's very different. So it's important to know, um, you know, the, the Tylenol versus the who knows what that looks similar, the, the, the difference between the clean filtered water versus the unfiltered water and then versus the kerosene. So that line is what the halacha says to do. If you don't know what that pill is, if you want to take some Tylenol and you know there's generic Tylenol that looks exactly like that, ask the person whose house it is and what counter it's on, is that generic Tylenol or not? Or today you can actually pull out your phone and go to Google and there are websites where pills generally have some sort of imprint on them. You can actually type in the imprint, the letters and the numbers on the pill and they'll actually tell you what medication it is. If you find a random pill lying around, if you have a look at it, there's always some sort of imprint or something. There are websites where you can type that in and it'll tell you exactly what it is. Then you know whether or not it's the right thing to take. And what that means in terms of, is this a standard I should lower? in order to increase the likelihood of this person participating and connecting to their roots and to their culture and tradition and to Hashem, to the Creator, to Torah, to Mitzvahs? Or is it not something at a standard I should lower? You've got to ask someone who can give you an answer, which generally is a rock. And there will be standards that you can lower for someone else that you wouldn't be low, lower for yourself. And there will be some things where the answer is no, that's not less filtered water, that's kerosene. That's going to be bad, not good. And that can happen. When we make decisions on our own without having sufficient information or guidance, we can pour kerosene on the fire. Now, let's say that, go back to the original example, if you walk into someone's kitchen, and you're in the kitchen, and they're cooking food, and there's a glass pitcher on the countertop, and it has transparent liquid in it, and there's a fire, it's very reasonable to assume that that's water. That being said, if it just so happens to be kerosene, and you pour it on the flame, it was a reasonable assumption in considering the circumstances. There's a fire. It needs to get put out. There's a pitcher full of transparent liquid in someone's kitchen. 99.999% likelihood that that's water. It's a, and all things considered, the cost-benefit analysis, it makes sense. Just take it, pour it, put out the fire. In that 0.001% of circumstances where it happens to have been kerosene, it's still going to do the damage. Right? The fact that it was a reasonable decision doesn't mean... Therefore, it won't do damage if it's the wrong decision just because I had the right intentions. And that's what happened here. 
Yosef saw a transparent liquid, assumed it was water when it was kerosene. And there is an in in Pirkeiovis, in the first chapter of Pirkeiovis, the one of the missioners says, "Heve mitamidov shall Aaron be among the students of Aaron." So about Aaron okay, and Moshe's brother. Right, and what was Aaron known for? Aaron was known for universal, unconditional love and acceptance, and he was a master at um, conflict resolution. Let's say, right, and that's what he would do. He would when there was a conflict, he would come. And he would assess and analyze what's going on. What, why is each person in this conflict feeling the way they are? What, what's going on you know, within each person's experience to create this conflicting situation or situation of conflict? And then he would go and with each person he would interact and damage control things in the way that was relevant to that person's viewpoint and, and perspective and experience. And then he would resolve conflicts. And the reason he did that and was so dedicated to it was because he loved everybody and he had unconditional love and acceptance. So the Mishnah says, Be among the students of Aaron. Oyev Shalom, love peace. Rodev Shalom, pursue peace. Or it doesn't mean pursue, it means one who loves. Be among the students of Aaron. What is a student of Aaron? Oyev Shalom, someone who loves peace. Rodev Shalom, someone who loves, who pursues peace. Oyev Esabrios, someone who loves the creations. And the reason that it uses the word creations here, which is a bit of a crude word, is intentional. If you look at someone and you do a fair, objective analysis of their behavior and you say, you know what? The only thing this person has going for them is the fact that they are Hashem's creation. Everything they do is bad. Everything they think is bad. Everything they say is bad. And that's extreme and that's never actually going to exist. But hypothetically, even if that was the case, even if the only positive adjective or word you could use to describe or refer to someone is the fact that they're Hashem's creation, if that's the only positive thing you have to say about them. Still, love someone even if their only virtue is that they are Hashem's creation. Or la Torah and bring them close to the Torah. Give them the opportunity to connect to Hashem, to the Creator through the Torah. So students of Aaron are people who love and accept everyone universally and therefore want to give everyone the opportunity to connect to Hashem through Torah. That being said, pay careful attention. It doesn't just say reduce the distance between the person and the Torah. Right now, to say reduce the distance between or the gap between the person and the Torah, you can do that many ways. If, I, if someone told me to reduce the gap between the pen and the pushka, the tobacco box, I could do that a number of ways. I could do it this way. I could do it this way, I could do it that way, I could do it that way, I could do it right. We have infinite variations of how to do that. If someone says, bring the pen to the tzedakah box, there's only one way to do it, and it's like that. So it didn't say, be from the students of Aaron, love and accept everyone unconditionally and pursue peace, and reduce the gap between them and the Torah, which you could do either by bringing that person closer to the Torah, or bringing the Torah closer to meet them. It doesn't say that. It says, bring them close to the Torah. Which means, what's the reason we want to bring someone close to Torah? Because Torah is a gift from Hashem. Torah is a means through which we can connect to Hashem. We can connect to infinity. We can increase our connection to divinity through Torah. That's through Torah. If we change Torah to bring it to meet someone who is not, doesn't have an active relationship and connection with Torah, and we change the Torah to meet them, well, it just might not be Torah anymore, and then it's lost all of its value. So, I'm just trying to think of an effective marshal, but I think it's clear enough, and I'm going to have to go a bit way out in the weeds to come up with something. So, it says, love them unconditionally, yes. Be aware and appreciate that every person deserves to connect to Hashem through Torah. And every person has what to gain through increasing their connection with Hashem through Torah. That includes all of us. Everyone, wherever we are, we can increase that connection to Torah. The way to do that is to bring them close to Torah. It's not to change the Torah to bring it close to them. Because what happens when you change the Torah? If you've changed the Torah, it just might not be Torah anymore. We may have just changed it from water to kerosene, which is what actually happened with Yosef. He meant well, and his assumptions were reasonable, but they were wrong. And so because he made these assumptions himself, he caused damage. He actually ended up adding 
Right? And if, if the instance like if Clipper would be a fire, then what he did, he literally tried to reduce the clip, he tried to reduce the negativity by pouring water on the fire, but that water was kerosene, which made it bigger. He was doing things that he thought would add positivity, reduce the net negativity in Mitzrayim, but he, didn't, he was mistaken, his assumption was mistaken, and he was actually increasing the net negativity in Mitzrayim. He was adding to the negativity instead of adding positivity to reduce net negativity. And his intentions were good, and the same thing can happen to us. Right there, many times where something looks like a good idea and our intentions are positive, we want to bring someone closer to Torah, and we say, well, you know what, like, whatever, it's fine. Like, you can lower the standards. This person's at zero right now in terms of their connection to Hashem through Torah Mitzvahs. You can lower the connection to bring them closer. Now, sometimes you can. But you have to know, am I lowering the quality of water or am I, have I turned it into kerosene? And to know the answer to that, either it's in Shulchan Aruch, and if it's not in Shulchan Aruch, we have to ask someone. Now again, the fine point is, yes, sometimes we have to make a decision in a matter of seconds, and we can only do our best. And you know what, sometimes we do our best and it turns out wrongly, that, that's, that's reality. But if we have the opportunity to look it up or to ask, and really the lesson is for people who kind of know that the Rav would say, don't do it, but come on, like, I could bring this person so much closer, I'm just going to do it anyway. It's like, yeah, this person's so thirsty, it's worth giving them less clean water, but if it's kerosene, you're not helping, making it worse.